I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we'll go ahead and start with any public comment. Uh, just a short one to on the subject of broadband internet. Uh, Summer Lake is one in, entry point, and also other things transpiring up north and the Burns and John Day and stuff like that. First off, did you guys sign on? I heard, but I wanted to make sure. Uh, in agreement with the uh, John Day, Burns, and Lakeview proposal to the town? We verbally agreed. We're looking at uh, uh, options because of all the uh, known uh, cultural issues. Sure. Rivers in and uh, along out every lake. Mm -hmm. um, and have not heard back from Grant County. Uh, communications or whatever they're called yeah. and they were aware of the, those issues as well uh, but okay. we have not paid our fee for the application yeah archaeology i spent 20 plus years and i was cross out on the second time so that's common for all things it's just how do you get around it or not a good point absolutely uh, yeah, that particular connection, we, for years we focused on Central Link, I back up to Central Link, going over Picture Rock Pass, as a, getting the back up. This particular route, if it comes about, will actually be, could be our primary internet provider and use Central Link as a backup. Central Link is only 48 strands, it's been there 40 plus years. And we got other communities that draws on it. The bandwidth, they don't have a bandwidth capacity for our future. A brand new 144 strands or greater would be the lifesaver for our generation tomorrow. So give us some thought along that line. On Summer Lake and the North Lake scenario, as you know, uh, Pfizer company under Snake River Solutions, uh, Chris Sutter, da da da. Uh, we see the RDOP will get your opportunity fund. I've worked with him several years. Now, Chris is kind of a controversial guy, but he's not in, in the picture right now, so we need to focus on getting that, making sure that that grant get implemented because it's it'll be another 15 to 20 years if we lose that option. So, focus on the grant, not the personality. And again, that personality is not in the picture right now. And along that way, that RDOF grant is for last mile, meaning <coughs> meaning connecting to uh, residents. The middle mile is to connect between like between communities. So there's a little conflict there for the RDOF funds to connect Paisley to Summer Lake. Before I left office, I was working with uh, the local ISP back in 2016 to get something into Summer Lake, but he decided to go a different route, so it didn't happen. But it's still on the chart. Uh, Pace, Paisley and uh, plus Adel was easier accomplishment because of the schools, e ray grants. Uh, Summer Lake doesn't have a school. So you had to go through a more obvious grant process through USDA, Reconnect, or through NTIA. Both of them have middle mile options. And if you find someone to work on that middle mile using either Reconnect, which is too late to put in for this year, but for next year, or the NTIA, National Telecommunication, Telecommunication Information Administration. 
Um, that may be a backup option for later this summer because we can't put in, we don't have time to put in for a reconnect. But uh, those are two options. If you've got a broadband group to work on, it would be because PLUS and ADEL, PLUS specifically, was the most dire need of technology. We got that accomplished. Now the most dire need for internet is Summer Lake. Like I said, I worked on it once, but I had a person back out on me, so we need to keep it back on the table. So, Does the NTIA grant allow for engineering costs as part of the grant? Uh, that's something for the great grant specialist to uh, investigate. All right, they have enough. So anyway, just sharing my little passion to get modern day broadband out to rural communities. For the kids today, be our community leaders tomorrow. So anyway, give us some thought, just a comment. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks guys. guys. Thank you. Um, let's go ahead to our additions and deletions. Any deletions? Uh, no deletions. I have two additions. I have um, the custodial position and the bus sale to the seniors. Okay. Let's go ahead and start with the custodial position. Do we want to have any discussion on that? I thought we had a good discussion yesterday. I think we uh, can come to a motion today that Probably will satisfy the board. Do you guys want to go with the twenty dollars an hour? I guess I'll find out what your motion is. Well, I'm I'm cool. You know, maybe trying to do a nineteen fifty or something. You know, I think that's that's generous. With the step program, right? Okay. And you know, we we can change this going forward if there's other possibilities <coughs> open for full time position. You know, to be able to fund that with the full benefit package and everything. So. The other thing to keep in mind is um, we have a backup janitor. I assume that this would also affect the backup janitor's pay as well. The backup jan janitor also has the opportunity to apply for the position. Sure. But, but, I, but I get what you're saying. That's our basement pay, pay him, which is what we would be worried about, what I would assume. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. I think um, uh, I make a motion that we approve a part-time custodial position at nineteen fifty uh, per hour. And uh, we just follow up to Jay and make sure we can't get that stuff straight. I'll second. Motion's been made and seconded. Do we want to have any further discussion? I think we need to make clear that our backup janitor will be brought up to that point also. Um, yeah, the backup janitor will be brought up to that pay. Uh, this We will leave it up to uh, HR to come up with a step, step pro, uh, process and part time means three and a half hours, right? Three and a half hours a day. Mm -hmm. And it also came with a, um, it'll come with set times. Yes. Motion has been made, seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Motion passes. I'll do a personal action form for a backup person. Um, when do you want that effective? I did one this pay period effective the first. But I can. Where are we at in the pay period? It ends. It ends in a couple of days, so I can make it effective now. Next, Next period. period. Okay, sounds good. All right, moving on, we'll go to the custodial. <laughs> the bus sale. <laughs> can sound effective. You're doing Groundhog's Day. Yeah, they go wriggle. So again, this is a bus that um, the county owns that um, currently rates out in poor condition, according to Blue Book, Kelly Blue Book, is that correct? 
According to ODOT's standards. According to ODOT's standards. Mm -hmm. It's met its useful life cycle for ODOT standards and is no longer something they want to keep. And we've replaced it in their fleet with a new one. And so they sign the title over to us. We can dispose of it if we sell it for over $5,000. We need to return the excess of that to them. But we have the option of donating it as well instead of auctioning it. So we have an interested party in the senior center, and uh, I think the, we'd like to make a motion to get that to the senior center as the backup bus. So is that your motion? I'll make a motion to approve the sale to the senior center of this uh, bus we're talking about for the amount of one dollar to the county. Second, giving the bus to the senior center. Second. Motion been made and seconded. Any more discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Um, the Southern Cascade Behaviors Batters Intervention Services. <coughs> Two of them, right? Yeah. Both are fiscal impact of 15,000. Mm -hmm. One's for batterers and the other one's for sex offenders. Okay. okay. I'll make a motion to approve uh, the Southern Cascade Behavioral Health and Lake County Community Justice. Agreement with the fiscal impact of fifteen thousand dollars per year to help with domestic violence inter inter intervention provider program. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passed. Moving down to the Southern Cascade Behavior Offender Treatment Services. Services. Uh, Chair, I will make a motion to approve the Southern Cascade Behavior Health and Lake County Community Justice um, Agreement uh, that pertains to um, sex offender treatment provider. Second. Second. Motion to made and seconded. Any further discussion on that? Again, a fiscal impact of fifteen thousand dollars per year. Thank you, Chair. All in favor say aye. 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 IGA with OYA. <coughs> OYA stands for Oregon Youth Authority. That is the one I do not have in front of me. Okay. Make a motion to approve the Oregon Youth Authority and Lake County Community Justice Juvenile IGA with a fiscal impact of six thousand five hundred and ninety six dollars and eighty cents. That's a biennium. For the biennium of uh, January 2nd of 22 through January 1st of 2024. Second that motion. Motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? This, I think this is a really good program because um, anybody that tried to get their charges expunged previously, had to hire their own lawyer, go through the process. Some of them were very low-ranking misdemeanors, but that were following the youth into their adulthood. And so this way, their expungement happens automatically, uh, unless it's a sex crime or a violent crime. And uh, so we did it. All in favor, say aye. 
Session and regular session from January 5th, 2021. Second. It, hang on one second. One, two. 22. Thank you. Copy, copy. You passed. Nice catch. <laughs> I said it actually uh, twice and I only caught it on the second time. Nice catch. <laughs> nice catch. Thank you. I'll second that. All in favor say aye. 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 Were we going to talk about the camping ordinance? What do we got to do on that? that? We need to start the ordinance process. Schedule it for sure. hearing. Two, two hearings. So, do we need to make a consensus to do that? That. Um, the fairgrounds manager, excuse me, the fairgrounds um, contract with Jake. We're going to wait to make sure the fairgrounds board approves it and uh, approve it after their February meeting. Okay. Um, on that one, um, did we want to make any kind of consensus on the ATV road use? Or further discussion? I move that we uh, table that discussion until we have more information to the course. Officially tabled. Um, we had a good uh, conversation yesterday on the solar committee and uh, on the building department. I really appreciated the conversations that we had. Uh, I wrote down a few things that we might start looking at a little deeper when it comes to our solar process. Those were making sure we protect the private property rights of people that want to have a solar farm, um, but also protecting our uh, farm ground and our grazing ground. Um, we talked about extending the distance between houses, the uh, setbacks, um, the public process, making sure we have ample public process and opportunities for the public to engage um, the GIS as a key component to future sites, um, road use agreements, plot plans, um, one of the things that we didn't discuss a whole lot but and I don't know if we could do this, but the revenue, I think it was Carl Shumway brought it up about revenue being clarified before the project actually starts. And, and so put that in as part of the planning process. And the reason that I would like that in there is because if we're going to enter into a virtually a lifetime contract, 25 year lifetime contract with a contractor. I think we need as a board to be able to see do we want that contract for 25 years before it's built instead of then building the project and then having the leverage to leverage what they want instead of the county. I'm just throwing that out there as a discussion piece. Um, if we knew what the contract was prior to the building, it would help us, you know, in the future. No, I'm not the case. Well, so traditionally, I think the um, 
community service, SIP, pilot, whatever you want to have, comes after after the project's approved, but before it's built. So you guys will negotiate a contract after it goes through planning. Which actually, though, and, and I agree 100%, because you're going for a land use your permission, you know, whether this is going to be approved or not, do you want to spend too much, a huge amount of time trying to figure out what this agreement's going to look like before you even get approved for land use? And typically, you know, that's the first step is to make sure you, it's even allowable. Um, but actually, in the case of Obsidian, um, just using that as an example, uh, that SIP agreement was put in place before you and I were even in office, and yet it came before us on an appeal to evaluate the land use. Uh, so, you know, sometimes it actually could be put into place prior to. Um, so now it's like, how, what did you say again? Can you repeat what you said as far as? It's after the building process. Yeah, so it goes through planning commission, and then that's approved. If it gets final, like it's not appealed or anything, then they come to you guys with some sort of investment plan, generally, and then you guys negotiate. Whether it's a SIP, if it's a can have SIP project, or a pilot, if it's going to be just like a local solar farm, and you guys have some leeway. I agree, though, like maybe in the upfront part, you could say, hey, we're not going to go below this megawatt rate or something and right. just like have like your guys' expectations kind of lined out like so they can say, oh, Lake County is where I want to go or Lake County is not going to take below yeah. $7,000 a megawatt. Right. And, and again, that 7,000 per megawatt, I worked a lot on that, but I only worked on the pilot agreement. A SIP is something entirely different. And the only reason I was working on a pilot was because it had a sunset date at the legislature within the state. And so that was coming up, and the question was whether or not they were just going to let it away <coughs> and not use the pilot anymore, uh, or they were going to um, extend it. And of course, everyone wanted to extend it, but that also left the option to reduce the rate, and everyone wanted to reduce the rate, or at least the developers did. Um, but if you go with a SIP, you have to consider, you know, okay, megawatt, you know, nameplate capacity might be a lot lower than 7,000 per megawatt because you also have the community service fee and the ad valorem taxes. And so, you know, once you add those things on, and, you know, nameplate capacity might not even be able to, might not even be able to quantify that yet or calculate it because it's based on how much you're actually able to produce. And if you haven't built it yet, you haven't gone through land use, you don't actually know how many acres are actually going to be excluded or chopped up or chopped out. You might not know what that is. So land use is critical to get that figured out before you can even calculate what nameplate capacity might even be. Um, I do want to share some because I think those are all really good points that I think that we need to make sure that we're taking a close look at these agreements because as you say, you know, it's a contract for a long period of time. And uh, we want to make sure that our communities are getting the best deal. But it was brought up yesterday, and we didn't really have the time to go into it. It wasn't really the format, but it was it, it was mentioned, and I forget who mentioned. I think it was actually the solar um, developer from City, and I think it was Lori Hutchison, who brought up um, a lot of conversations around the state right now around siting. And there is, in fact, there is. Um, I was contacted yesterday by Oregon Consensus, who apparently got wind of some things that I had said on a CREA phone call, that I had expressed a little bit of unsatisfaction or dissatisfaction with how some things were being done and the appeals constantly and everything else, like people need to get their ducks in a row. And I was a little frustrated by the fact that I heard that there was this huge siting conversation going on and no one had communicated with counties. Being that we're the ones that are typically approving the siting and by law mitigation agreements around, you know, and that, that there's siting factors with that as well. You know, what was a good mitigation plan look like? Okay, so you're having a statewide discussion and you haven't invited a single commissioner. Pete Runnels and I were like livid. And I didn't know it at the time, but apparently uh, Pete Runnels has, had gotten a hold of these guys 
and then you know expressed his dissatisfaction and dropped my name and said you need to do your research and you need to get a hold of these different people so they did and i had had chance by that time to go through before i had communicated with them i was intending to reach out to them but they called me first <clears throat> i can send this to you guys it's oregon smart sighting collaborative is what they formed they were paid by Renewable Northwest and Onda are some of their funders. And now not all the stuff that they, and I explained this to them. Well, it, 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 well, it was, and I, you know, and I was still doing my research when they called and, and I was reading through the material, but they do identify in here um, on the si uh, sizing opportunities and preventative, preventing conflicts. They explain that large-scale developments can also conflict with the protection of natural resources and cultural resources. That was one of the very first lines of their document where they identify the conflicts that there can be between, <coughs> which I think echoes the essence of what we discussed last night, really, was the conflict between large-scale development of this type and the natural and cultural resources that we're looking to protect. So um, I told them that they needed to make sure that they were engaging with us because when we talk about siting, when we talk about the preservation of private property and everything else and, and making sure that we're having a holistic look at this, I don't want to leave out the mitigation agreements. And, and this is why, because I've never explained this in a public meeting. My concern is that there is a movement within the state that would like to see mitigation agreements exclude cattle from mitigation areas because they're permanent wildlife corridors or easements. What that does, and, and I, I think you know, group when I see groups like Onda or or others, because they've supported, it's no secret, they've supported those concepts in the past of removing cattle from the landscape. If you have private property that we identify as only 20 some odd percent of our county. And a small portion of it, or no matter how small or big, is being taken out of agricultural use for a large scale solar development. And then you have, say, a two to one mitigation, twice the footprint of land for a mitigation area. Also, private property, typically, because we have never seen a mitigation agreement that included public land. <coughs> So you're, because you're, all you're playing with is private land at that point. That's your a whole sandbox. <clears throat> so you're, you're taking la private land out of use to put solar on it, and then you're taking twice as much and putting it in a mitigation area that you're also excluding agricultural use. Yeah, so we're, it's almost tripling. It, it, it is. It's tripling amount. the impact. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and that's only if it's at a two to one. And so, I think we need to be cautious of this and make sure that we're not accepting any of this. And, and now I've explained this to ODFNW, um, as to Sarah, to John Muir, to others, and they understand where I'm coming from. Um, so I don't feel like I'm, you know, this is a critical in any way, shape, or form. But the ODFNW at a state level have a policy of a zero net loss, a zero net loss policy for the wildlife habitat and everything else. So when they see an impact on private land, ODFNW comes to the table and they say, well, you're impacting wildlife here and we have a zero net loss policy. So we want you to have some mitigation over here. Now they're not demanding wildlife corridors or anything else, permanent easements, but if that goes through, because of their zero net policy on land they don't own, <laughs> you, you kind of see where I'm going with this. Is it, It's a concept of, of drawing it, drawing you know like big game winter range area over someone else's property and saying that you have a right over it because there's elk that graze through someone's pivot, and then you say, well, that's wildlife habitat. Well, yes. So you're saying that I I have to exclude all my agricultural use now in order to allow the wildlife. You know, I mean, they're not saying that, but I want to make sure that we're not allowing certain factions or groups within the state to push concepts like that of yeah. permanent wildlife easements. Cover back door. It, it, it's just, I, I, I've been on a lot of phone calls where that, 
that concept has snuck in and there's there's pieces of it in fragments and so when we look at siting it's not just a siting factor of where solar is appropriate but also a siting of where mitigation is appropriate and i'm doing this for and i'm saying this for the benefit of odfnw as well because they've obviously struggled with where developers want to do mitigation sometimes uh you know what is good mitigation i mean how many functional anchors are they getting out of it i think it's a it's a round of conversation that needs more work. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of throwing that out there for. Those are great, great, great points. Yeah. I like the, you know, maybe what would help us a bunch in sighting <clears throat> is if we had something similar to zero net loss on our farm ground. I don't know how we could pull that out. It's hard because you're dealing with private land. Right, right. And so how do you do that? And so, but I love the concept. Um, you know, uh, Richard Bradbury brought up something pretty well too, is that these solar developers could set their <coughs> panels higher and allow the cattle, sheep, goats, whatever, to graze underneath. Because if you go past the, any solar plant, there's a lot of, there's abundant feed under those panels, usually. And um, if they could use them, continue using them for pasture, it would, it would save a ton of headache. Then we wouldn't be losing that aspect and approving these, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so this is, I, I want to share this because I, I looked into this. This is what you're talking about is what they call agrivoltaic solar. We do not have agrivoltaic solar in Oregon. Um, what we okay. have, well, it's just because it's, it comes to a money factor and I can explain. Uh, so <laughs> I, I researched it, and the people who have done the most amount of work on agrivoltaics and researching it and looking at rules for what they call dual use, because you're, you're, you're not taking farmland out of production, you're just having a dual use for it. Europe has done the biggest amount of work on this project, uh, and, they, and there was a, the Fraunhauser Institute in Germany actually wrote the rules for the European Union for land use around agrivoltaic. And they have literally two rules. And one of them is that solar is only acceptable where it complements and has a synergistic effect on agricultural land. And the reason for that is because Europe, we can, I'm going to get stoned for bringing up European policies in a Lake County meeting. Um, but the reality is, is that Europe did bring most of what you know we have as modern day farming forward um, and many of the modern day farming practices. Europe and places like Holland, for example, Holland is a huge exporter of food. They, they grow more food than just about anyone per capita in the world. Um, ever, and so when they put in solar and there was an experiment they did with solar and the guy did it on a raspberry farm and basically they spaced the solar cells a little bit further apart in the transparent panels and they actually built greenhouses, so to speak, with these things. They were producing 10 megawatts of solar on one footprint of land where the crop being produced and the Fraunhauser Institute said we could do this with just about any crop and they did, they did this on multiple ones. The top three during uh, cold, wet years, they saw a decrease uh, to crop production. But during hot, dry years, which are very common out here, uh, they saw a crop increase of production by up 10 to 12 percent for potatoes, celery, winter wheat, everything. Um, and they and 50 percent reduction in water consumption. 50% because of the, the space under the panels and everything else. And I run sheep. <coughs> now, sheep, the biggest loss that you know impact a sheep when you run them is sun because they're wearing wool and everything else, you know, and you can have weight loss issues and everything. If you have shade that you provide them, you have a synergistic effect. 
We don't do agrivoltaic because it creates it ha it has lar longer poles or more cost to the developer, and so it's just something that's never been experimented with in Oregon. What we have is pseudo agrivoltaic developers, typically that pass themselves off as complementing agriculture, and I I think you know when we talk about having something that complements the farmer, conserves water by fifty percent. We were all at you know, in, up in Christmas Valley, when we listen to some of the water issues that they're having, and they're looking at water conservation methods, um, all those things are tools that we can provide to the public if we take the red tape out of the way. But it's we also want to make sure that we're looking at the whole picture. I'm so so, so in the plan uh, on Blue Marmots, I noticed that they have the option of doing two and they didn't do it but i'm assuming that every solar developer is getting that option um and i'd like to look into that more but anyways i'm going to promote it so okay. yeah i i took a ball. you got to think about it though too if you're going to put cattle underneath solar you're probably going to have to use concrete mm -hmm. to keep your pole so well i mean and then so you look at what in that when it's over 25 years, yanking all that stuff out, you know, just increase cost, increase impact. To the ground. So that's a really good point, and we did talk about that with some of the folks that I was talking about agrivoltaics takes with. It doesn't really fit for cattle production as as much as it does with smaller animals like goats and sheep and things. But it's something that maybe we need to start trying to develop because if like if you drive out of town. And the, the one on Rabbit Hill Road, the, it's growing more grass around that, those panels than I've ever seen in that area. You know, where they don't mow, you know, when they go down through there with their brush hog, the stuff they leave in between, mm -hmm. shoot, that grass is that tall. And yeah. I'm, I'm assuming that that's never been. So it goes back to the science part of what you were talking water about. Water conservation and crop increase it, production. It's almost like acting like a greenhouse effect of some kind. Yeah, you might not be necessarily a rancher. You might be a farmer that wants to grow something you know, different or grow potatoes even. If it can suit a use and reduce your water consumption, it's a tool to a farmer to use, at least on a small scale. Um, but yeah, it. it I figured I'd share that with you guys because I've been dealing with a lot of it's good to know. just it's just back and forth. I've been looking at both sides of this argument and trying to just educate myself on the issue, and it's it's a big big issue that no one can really come to a solid um, you know agreement on in the past. So moving on with that, I had battery houses on there. Um, progressive goals. Um, Jim brought up a good one was the soil, actual soil grade. You know, if the soil grade is junk, you know, where it doesn't grow anything, changes the whole yeah. aspect. But if you have yeah. really good soil in a certain place, we want to avoid those. Um, and then the dual use thing. And if you guys had anything else that you wanted to add, I'd like to print this up, give it to Dharma, and get it to our solar committee, our planning department, and continue this <clears throat> discussion of what, you know, the direction that we want to go as far as so so. Not limited to, but yeah. And I, I, I'm, I think everything should be able to, even if we have these in here, everything should be able to be mitigated. You know, I mean, there's going to be circumstances for virtually everything. You know, and so if we're if they're able to come to us and say, hey, this doesn't work because of this, can we mitigate this part out? Yeah, I have no problem with that. It's just I really have a problem where 
being force-fed something and us not having anything to back ourselves up with. And so, anyways, carrying on. Do you guys have anything you want to else you want to discuss? Updates? Um, I am going to go to DC for NACO February 11th through the 16th, I believe. So, I'm going yeah. for the agriculture part of it and the natural resources. And <coughs> the downside is, is I don't know that you know, they're in session. Well, that's why I was out. But the natural resources discussions are huge. And um, I think you'll benefit the county, the whole county, by launching. I'll try to attend an energy meeting as well. Thank you, Eric. I'll be going to the Oregon Fair Association the 6th through the 9th. Um, and so I think we're having meetings then, correct, Mo? Do we have a commission meeting that week? Yes, we do before, I believe. Okay. I was just going to try to fix that. <coughs> I'm also going to meet with AOC on the 10th, since I'm already up there. I'm going to have some discussions on some Eastern Oregon plans that we might have or discussion to make sure our voices are and so if either of you two want me to discuss any subject, just give me the information you want me to talk about. I'm also bringing this forward to the Eastern Oregon Association of Counties. So if there's some other commissioners over there at the same time, I'd like them to join me in the meeting just to talk about Eastern Oregon stuff and to get our voices heard at the state level. I know the derbies. Sorry. <laughs> so, one one uh, date that's super important, Commissioner, if you could make is the reconnect grant discussion for the railroad. I believe that's on the sixteenth of February, and that's when I'll be coming home. So, that's going to need our support. The railroad reconnect grant. Are we going to be? Are they going to be in short session then? Are they going to be? Uh, we got some emails there from David Answer okay. that uh, describes it all. So I'll, I'll have all the information <coughs> prepared. Um, we do have an executive session on the thirty-first. By the way. Yes. Just. Uh, pertaining to the ongoing litigation. Um, That's some of what we discussed yesterday. No. 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 Yeah, we can't can't yeah can't talk about it right now. But it, it, Melanie can fill you in. Okay. Thank you. Or or Dave. Uh, Mr. Schulberg, do you want to uh, no. kind of give us an update on the fire got... events? I don't know. Well. Yeah, for transport meeting last night. Um, one of the is the big issue that uh, is before the defense board was is that they originally received uh, five hundred thousand uh, dollars that was uh, from ARPA funding uh, through Representative Breeze Iverson, and a week or two ago, uh, all the way up to a week or two ago, we. We're under the impression that we had to follow ARPA rules. We, we do, to an extent, have to follow ARPA rules because the money that was given to the RFPAs, the Rangeland Fire Protection Association, was lottery dollars. So they had no restrictions on how they spent the money. So ARPA rules fell back to more uh, water, broadband, housing. following those lines of, of thought, but um, the state got back to us and said that revenue loss to the county also is a factor and that, that this would fall under that. So it allows uh, fire departments to utilize the money. 
under current ARPA rules, utilizing the, the rental loss route. So that's good news. They're busy finishing up their paperwork to submit to the state so that uh, we have seven rural fire departments in Lake County. And they are working on a plan to upgrade uh, protective uh, equipment, <coughs> PP&E, they all, they all desperately need radios. They need uh, you know, a multitude of things that to get them a little more up to speed. Their goal is that they would uh, eventually have some very nice uh, Type 6 engines uh, that potentially could go on some of these state mobs across the state to help other counties. Uh, but right now, we don't have the equipment to drive out of town very far to make that happen. So, uh, trying to get up to speed. There's also other uh, things that uh, Senate Bill that, uh, 762 that is looking at um, adding 75 engines to the fleet of the state of Oregon and Lake yeah. through Oregon State Fire Marshal. Yeah, folks. <clears throat> and Lake County is hopeful that we may be in line for a few of those engines. Um, so that there, what this all means is that we're going to get some upgrades in our county fire departments, or most of fire departments, yeah. throughout the county. So that, was, that was the big item. Um, what else? Uh, we talked radio frequencies for too long. Um. <laughs> the key there is that, you know, we have wildland urban interface fires, the county or these volunteer fire departments show up, we got the federal Forest Service BLM and state uh, resources show up, can't communicate, uh, it's a dangerous situation and not ideal, we're making sure that we all have the same bank of channels, both fed and private, to where we roll up, we can be either on, on local county channels or we can be on federal channels and have those folks convert over, depending on the uh, ownership of the fire. <coughs> That's a big one. We talked a little bit about numbering of vehicles as well and the numbering system that we use to number the apparatus. And that was some good conversation there. I, I personally would like to see all of our fire departments in Lake County using the same numbering system. Um, you know, I think RFPAs are doing a little bit something different, you know, what works for them, but at least the fire departments, because the way they're numbered, it tells you what's coming. If you get, if you say rig, you know, vehicle 3146 or whatever, you know what kind of rig it is. Is it a heavy? Is it a small engine? You know, is it a tender? And so, uh, not all of our fire departments are using the same system, but I think there was some good discussion last night that that may be where we're going, kind of get everyone on the same page. That's a great idea. Uh, so, so, yeah. If I just started with three, it might be a heavy then. Or yeah, like well, that. like, I think the first be the first two numbers are like, you know, what the vehicle number is or something, and like the third number and the fourth designate, you know, what kind of vehicle and what's what's on its way. And it helps, and you don't want road system that I didn't know about until Barry told me. Yeah, tell me. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it also will tell you what departments it's it's coming from too, because of the different station numbers and everything else. And we don't want vehicles with the same number on. Um, you know, so that's it's really critical we get everyone on the same page. But, thank you. Um, I just told you before we started the meeting, I'm in a meeting at two o'clock today, uh, interviewing the new water master. Oh. Uh, so uh, two o'clock. One candidate. They had one candidate from in uh, internally. Um, and so we're gonna interview him at two and see how that goes. If they don't like, if we don't uh, like it, we can put it back out for other candidates. Is the duty station Lake View, Oregon? That's a, that's one of my questions. Okay. You know, I, I, I'm I not do. working remotely. Okay. That's what I told you. We already got two water masters for Lake County, mm -hmm. and the North End water master is working out of the Hud Bend. Yeah. We don't need without any of them. 
without any of our input. Yeah. yeah. And that portion. You know, I have a list of questions. One of them would be, you know, like, okay, if you have a landowner that is potentially out of compliance or out of, uh, you know, that is in violation or taking water from someone else or using too much, whatever it might be, um, that he doesn't have a water right for, what is your first or second primary goal? What is what is your MO? What 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 is what are what are you intending to achieve when you interact with them? Um, my hope is he says something to the effect of voluntary compliance, working with the landowner. If if you know he says something like, you know, well I just dropped the hammer down on him or something like that. Right? That would harken back to previous water masters that we have had in this county that created a huge amount of issues for us and the water, for the water resource. So, um, if either of you have any questions that you'd like to see asked, you know, that you have some concerns, um, jot them down and I'll make sure that I kind of have those, you know, presented to the water resource before two o'clock today. You pretty much do what I want. You already told me to ask what I want. So. Okay. Um, I'm going to be gone on the 4th of February for EOCCO board meeting in Portland at Moda Tower. So we're actually having our first in person meeting in two years. So, or since February of 2020. So, this is kind of a big deal to get. The whole board together again and actually do some work. Um, it's nice to see them getting brave enough to do it. Um, library, we've got to put that position has been put out there. They're still looking to do do interviews at some point once they get enough applicants. Um, roads. Um, I was going to mention this, but actually, Commissioner Schoenberg, you could have a better idea. They're going to open up that road um, going down to Modoc County from the Warner Valley. Kevin's going to open that up because Modoc County, I guess, is opening up their side. And so we have some ranchers that need that. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. And we had two search and rescues off of that last week on the same day. Right. And so it's, it's signed as no winter maintenance. Uh, Obviously, when we're getting all the snow, it's more than what our road crew can do. But now that we've had this mild weather, we're going to take a look at it and see if we think about getting it open. So, Mohawk County is going to do their side, Lake County is going to do theirs. So, a little update. Is there an ETA on that? I had a concern. So ETA? Mm -hmm. uh, I believe, uh, yeah. Uh, Beginning today, yeah. It should be opened up by tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. That will adjourn the meeting at 10.50.